Okay. As a member of Decreasing the Distance, an SFUSD parent and caregiver collective advocating for equitable education solutions, we want to welcome you and thank you so very much for joining this conversation tonight about COVID-19 safety and schools. We are absolutely thrilled to have more than 500 people from across the SFUSD community with us tonight. Teachers, staff, parents, philanthropists, community leaders, and even students. Before we begin, I want to mention we are recording tonight's event to share this critical information with others who are unable to attend. In the chat, you'll find information about interpretation. Due to an issue with Zoom, our Cantonese interpreter will be on the channel for German. So if you select German, you will hear the Cantonese interpretation. We aren't really sure why that happened, but welcome to a grassroots parent planned event. This conversation tonight couldn't be more timely as we and the rest of the country are watching COVID numbers rise. One of the key things we have been hearing from many members of the San Francisco community, families, teachers, and staff is that we all need more information on the latest scientific data to be able to make good informed decisions for ourselves and our families. A few months ago, I attended a lecture featuring one of our presenters tonight, Dr. Naomi Bardock. And I kind of got a little bit obsessed about how much I still really didn't know about the changing landscape of COVID-19 surrounding transmission, my children's futures, and our family's future especially given all of the other information that was out there and that had been out there since March. While I listened to that lecture, and it was a lot of science and numbers that I didn't really understand, what I was able to understand that night gave me so many moments of just, wow. Um, after I listened a little bit more, it was from wow to pretty much, oh wait, what? And uh, it was basically very eye-opening for me. One of my immediate wishes that night was that everyone everywhere would be able to have some easy access to that information, but certainly here in San Francisco where we live. I was lucky enough to find parents like me who also shared the desire to have that information pushed out as well. My hope tonight is that many families will see this presentation and it will provide you with a sense of where we are today in our fight against COVID-19. For all of those reasons, I am incredibly grateful and blessed to Dr. Naomi Bardock and Dr. Raul Gutierrez for volunteering their time and expertise for our community tonight and to speak on the ever-changing climate of COVID-19. We have left the uh, chat open. We will have some time at the end for Q&A, but given the amount of attendees, we want to make sure you know we have asked for pre-submitted questions from our broader community. Those questions come from families, educators, but we promise we're going to make as many questions from the chat, from the Zoom, available as possible. Okay, and now I'd like to introduce Dr. Naomi Bardock. Dr. Bardock is an Associate Professor of Pediatrics and Policy and the Philip R. Lee Institute for Health Policy Studies at the University of California, San Francisco. She's also leading COVID-19 research to inform safe and successful school reopenings. Naomi, as I mentioned, we are so excited that you're able to offer any guidance or information that you believe would be helpful to the broader San Francisco community. So welcome and thank you. Thank you, that Thank you so much. Really kind introduction. And uh, I'll get started with the the slideshow and it'll provide some context and actually sort of a response to many of the things that Yvette said already actually which I appreciate. Um, so we are here 
uh, the title of our event tonight is COVID-19 Community Safety, Schools, and San Francisco. Um, so a really important thing to say out loud uh, as I give any of these talks is um, sort of the perspectives I bring. I'm a pediatrician and a parent. As a pediatrician, I, I work at Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital, and I take care of many patients who are in the San Francisco Unified School District. And I care deeply about those students being able to be back in school. As a parent, I have a kid who's particularly struggling quite a lot right now, and I really want him to be back in school. But I am also a doctor, and I have a commitment to all people's health. And I'm a health policy researcher, which means I think about how do we actually do things right as in our healthcare delivery and in our society to support people's health. And so that means I hold both perspectives for all, all people, not just kids, not just adults, we're thinking about everybody together. Um, other disclosures, our understanding of, of this disease is rapidly evolving. What I tell you today might be different tomorrow. There's new things com that come out quite often. And it's a team sport requiring unprecedented levels of collaboration. So I, I'm working with a ton of different people. All of us are working very hard to keep up with the literature and to interpret the literature, whether it's basic science or epidemiology or clinical medicine about how to take care of COVID. It's really important to frame the school conversation, to think broadly about it. It's not just, you know, how do we reopen? It's also what's the meaning behind it? And we know that the COVID-19 pandemic has caused economic devastation and financial instability across all communities. Though there's a limited illness burden in children, families with children bear a large brunt of the economic devastation, which is mediated through school and childcare closures. And though we track all of the, sorry, the slide here is showing all of the case rates of COVID-19. This is what we follow very closely. We track that so closely, we don't have the same kind of metrics or visual tracking about the harms associated with closure, either for society at large and particularly for kids. And there's a very, very recent article that just came out that estimates the long lasting health effects for elementary school age children due to the loss of education that we just always have to hold as we consider the school um, conversation. We need to hold both the COVID infections and also the effects um, on everybody, on the children and the families. And I think it's also really helpful to talk about this. Um, the, the intellectual and emotional journey has actually been hard and it will continue to be hard and it goes up and down a lot. And I think it's always helpful to sort of think through what are these stages that we've gone through. The first stage was children are viral vectors. We know they give us every virus. That's coughs, that's colds, that's diarrhea, that's influenza. Having schools be open would be a terrible idea. That was the beginning of the pandemic. No schools should be open. Stage two was as we were going through, we had gotten through the first stage, schools maybe can reopen in the fall. Globally, other countries are doing it. There seems to be pretty low risk. We know that the risk to kids and families, uh, if you don't reopen, is pretty high economically and educationally. We should really be thinking about doing this. That was probably early summer. And then stage three, we began to surge. That was July. Teachers got worried, families got worried. Some families also got a little desperate feeling about the idea that their kids wouldn't be going back to school. There were a lot of news articles every single day. It was a huge emotional roller coaster. Once we got to the other side of the surge, which was probably September or so, San Francisco Department of Public, uh, probably late August, September, San Francisco Department of Public Health started to allow school reopening. The state said, okay, if you're not in the purple tier, you can think about doing this. We got out of that tier and SFDPH said, okay. And then, but the SFUSD timeline was still pending and we, but we were in a pretty good spot, orange or yellow. And we literally just recently in the last week or so, we started to go back, go into a new stage, which is cases were rising in San Francisco and now we're back in the red tier. Um, nationally, cases were, are really rising. So we're, we're rising in San Francisco, but just to help put it into context as people read the news, we are not rising the same way other places in the country are, but it's, it's nerve wracking. Um, we do have a vaccine in sight, but it's down the road and we're not there yet. And it probably is not gonna solve this problem by the end of this school year, unfortunately. And we just put high school opening on pause. 
So the goal for today is to at least go over what do we know? We have learned a lot since March. What do we know to inform this idea of school reopening versus, or, or how do we reopen? Do people stay open? Do you close? And then how does it inform in school learning in the next stage? How do we think about um, where we are now and where we're going? So a couple of things I'll just say, educators are key partners. So there's a false narrative out there, like from early in the summer, pediatricians say one thing and they disagree with teachers and there's some kind of disagreement. No, what is good for teachers is good for students, is good for families. And the school reopening goals have to be safe and successful reopening for everybody. So we know more now than we did in March. What do we know? I'm gonna give you guys a summary of the data on COVID and children and also transmission in the school-based setting or sort of in the educa indoor educational settings. I highlight some themes and some key articles and reports. I don't have enough time to do everything and there's too much out there to do everything, you'd be bored stiff. But I do try and choose things for their rigor, for how well they've been done, how, how good of a scientific article that it is, because it's imperative to get this right. I'm not, like I said in the beginning, I wear multiple hats. My, my biggest hat is we have to get it right. It's not a pediatrician hat, a parent hat, a you know, healthcare policy. It's that we have to get it right hat. Um, or I've chosen because they captured a lot of attention at some point, but they're not well done. And I want to help to explain it for people because because some articles came out, particularly in the middle of summer, that were confusing. And then the last thing, just to teach you guys a little bit, I do whenever I see something new, so that going forward you might see something new. How do you how do you think about it? I always think, do they con does it confirm? Does it say yes, that is correct to what we already know, or might it change our understanding? And that's partly based on how good is the study. So I like to give the take home point up front. What is our summary? Children get COVID-19 less often and are less ill than adults. Children do not seem to be major sources of transmission to each other or to adults. Transmission in elementary schools likely differs from high schools and middle schools. And then adult to adult transmission is the most likely thing that happens actually in the school based setting, just based on what we've seen, but also therefore where we have the most control. The other really important piece is community prevalence is going to affect our school based cases. So, you know, we, a school based case means that it's a student or a staff who is associated with a school. It doesn't mean transmission is happening, but as our numbers go up in our community, it will just happen that we are going to have some school-based cases. It's helpful to think that through and what are we going to do to help prevent that school-based case becoming other um, infections in the school. And then we have key mitigation strategies, masking, small stable cohorts, ventilation, symptom screening, and screening for contacts for, uh, for anybody who's a close contact of COVID-19 um, uh, case. So the first sort of piece that's really a helpful piece is to understand why do children get COVID-19 infrequently and have less severe disease? It's kind of a weird thing that it doesn't happen actually for many other diseases. And the, the, the basic story is that there's something called an ACE2 receptor. It is the entryway, the doorway for COVID. And this is basically a little picture of SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19 entering into a cell in our body using the ACE2 receptor. Whoop, there's the door, you gotta open it up. So our ability to make the ACE2 receptors, to make the door, varies with age. Elementary school students make the ACE2 receptor less than middle and high school students who make it less than adults. The implication is that if you have fewer doorways to let the virus in, you get less disease and more mild disease. So the other thing to know about um, uh, uh, um, infections in kids is that most school-aged children actually get COVID from a household contact. And that's been shown consistently in multiple different studies in Greece, in Australia, in China, in Switzerland, in Chicago. And it happens even when schools are open. So some of these studies were done when everything was shut down, total lockdown. So then you don't really, it's like, well, of course they got it from the person at home because that's where they were. But that it's actually the story that happens even when schools are open. Um, and it's probably because there's just much closer physical contact with family members more than you have in your schools. Um, and here's a couple of things, studies that sort of illustrate this pattern of kids not really transmitting very much. Um, so there's a, a case study of a French nine-year-old, just one kid, but it's like a, a kind of dramatic story and I think tells the story pretty well. 
Um, it's not large numbers, but it's it's a it's a kid who had co-occurring influenza and COVID-19. He was like in a French ski alp chalet, and he got it from another um, uh, traveler. And he afterwards, without knowing he had COVID-19, he went to three different schools, had contact with 80 different kids, and there were zero cases in those 80 kids, but they did have influenza. So this kid who had both influenza and COVID-19 didn't pass around the COVID-19, but did pass around the COVID, uh, but did pass around the influenza. So we know from that that, um, and we, we know that influenza passes between kids very easily, and COVID is not acting that way. This other study is a study in Australia, and this is where we get a ton of numbers to sort of tell the same kind of story that I just told you. 10 early childhood centers and 15 schools, over 6,000 people. Overall, there were very, very low numbers. Only 1.2% of people got COVID-19 in this whole group. Most of them, more than 90% 90, 90 of them got it from a household contact. And this is with schools being open the transmission that did happen in schools of this 1.2%, there's just a little tiny bit of that that actually happened in schools. When it was child to child, it was only 0.3%. Child to staff, 1%. Staff to child was 1.5%. And staff to staff transmission was 4.4%. So you can see that it, the story here is it's very helpful for us to remember the biggest risk is adults passing it to each other in the school setting. And so we, we really want to focus on that piece. In addition, we do all those other safety measures for these other pieces of transmission, but it's just different than all of the rest of the coughs and colds and influenza where we think it's all about the kids. It's actually about the adults in the schools for COVID-19. And I'll say here, this actually, they weren't wearing masks in this in Australia at the time. They did do small stable cohorts, physical distancing, but they weren't wearing masks. This, this slide is actually about a story that was happening earlier in the summer, and I think it, did, it, it didn't totally go away. This is the worry that children are super spreaders, and that's based on a couple of studies that came out that just looked at what they call viral load. How much virus do you actually have in your nose? All of the studies that were done were kids who had symptoms. At that point in the pandemic, it was early in the pandemic, like March, April, that's when they studied these kids. We had very few kids being tested at that time because we didn't have very much access to tests and kids were mildly ill, so we were not testing very many kids. So the kids who are in this, these studies tended to actually probably be more sick than not. They actually had to go and have a reason to get a test. And they found that they had higher viral loads. They had more virus in their nose, but that's probably because they were sicker. And then, um, and, and the, other really important piece is that the implication from this is the way that it, the study got designed is first of all, nasal viral load doesn't necessarily mean risk of transmission. Like if you look back at the studies I just showed you, like, okay, maybe they had higher viral load, but they were all, but nothing seems to be happening there. And then the, these particular studies looked at symptomatic preschoolers. Well, okay, maybe they have higher viral loads, but we already have systems in place that say you're, if you have a symptom, you stay home. And that is how we break transmission. So even if some of these kids have higher viral loads, we have a system in place to help stop the transmission. Um, a couple of other things based on, so what, what have we seen? We've seen that they don't seem to transmit as efficiently. How come? Why aren't they passing it along? So there's the story of ACE2 receptors is why aren't they getting it? This is the story of why aren't they passing it along? We don't have great data on this. But there's some practical considerations. One is they have smaller lungs. In order to pass COVID along, you have to get enough viral particles out of your body and that they go to somebody else. They just have smaller lungs. They just make smaller, smaller clouds. They also have less severe disease. And so they just don't cough as much. They don't have as much coming out of them. So they're just not going to spread as easily as an adult who has a big cough. And then this is really very uh, you know, common sense. Children are shorter than adults. The way we pass COVID-19 from one person to another or the virus that causes COVID-19 is by what they call respiratory droplets, these things you can see in the picture, which is coming out of your mouth, usually happening when you're coughing, sneezing. Sometimes if you're doing like the loud singing and shouting, that can also do it. Most of the time, those respiratory droplets get pulled down by gravity. The heavier ones get pulled down, those coughing, sneezing ones. 
And so kids are just shorter, so they're not going to spread it up. They're going to just, it's going to fall on the ground. And the practical implications for teachers who are taking care of kids or adults who are taking care of a kid, if you know they have COVID-19, make sure that they're facing away from you. If you're, if you, if like teachers have said to me, like, what if I need to comfort a child? You can comfort that child. You can have them facing slightly away from you in your lap, facing forward, keep your head above them. If you're worried, you know, any kid that you're worried is crying, then those are the things you can do to kind of protect yourself. The other really important take home point, high schools are different from, from elementary schools. And so we have to think about them differently. Um, the community, these are, this is two studies from um, France early in the pandemic. There were no precautions in place. Community prevalence in France, at the, in this uh, area of France at the time, it was 9% of COVID-19. In the high school, they did a study afterwards of all um, uh, sort of any sign of people being infected in the high school and then in the elementary schools. In the high school, they found that 43% of teachers and 38% of students had been infected. In the elementary schools, it was 7% of teachers, 9% of students infected. So we can see that those elementary school numbers, those are actually very similar to the community prevalence numbers, which implies that the transmission can occur in high schools, but it's the community prevalence that's reflected in elementary school cases, adding to the understanding that probably elementary school students are not transmitting it as much as the high school students can. So we have to be thoughtful about those high school students. And this is a case, this is a study that teaches us what not to do. It's an, it was an outbreak that happened over the summertime in, in a high school in Israel. They reopened in mid-May. They had an outbreak in the school in late May of more than 150 infections. And it was associated with, there was a heat wave a few days after they, reopening, they reopened and they said, okay, it's too hot. Everybody can take off your mask for a couple of days, two days. The index cases, the kids who were the infections that then led to the outbreak everywhere else, were present in the school and had symptoms. At the same time, because of the heat, they had the air conditioning on and they had all the windows closed. So it teaches us what not to do. The implications from this is that masks are important, physical distancing are important, and ventilation are all key. And I'm sorry, I forgot to mention, they also, they didn't have, um, uh, physical distancing. They had brought back all the students in, in full, a full classroom. So, and then the last piece is that symptom screening probably could have potentially helped to keep those kids out of school. Um, a brief moment just about how to do it right. Uh, we did an indoor camp pilot to test feasibility and acceptability of student self-collection actually of, of doing testing on their own, K kindergarten through eighth graders. They did great. They also, we also looked at the camps in action and we saw in San Francisco two, two camps successfully being able to mask even with young kids, stable cohorts, physical distancing, hand hygiene, ventilation, all in place really nice. There weren't any documented cases. And so it's possible to follow public health principles. We, it was a good demonstration. And we see that also in Rhode Island had a similar experience in their summer programs. They had almost 19,000 children that they were following. Again, very few cases, 52 cases. They closed down a lot of programs because they closed things just with kids with symptoms. Uh, sorry, even if you just had symptoms, they closed down a cohort. Um, and then the cases did increase as community prevalence rose. And so this community prevalence story is an important one that we learned over the summer. But what did they do? They did stable pods of 12, then they increased it to 20 in, uh, halfway through the summer. They did separate spaces, no intermingling, universal masking of adults, but they actually didn't require it for children. They did daily symptom screening um, and enhanced cleaning and disinfection, and the classes closed if you were symptomatic. Here in San Francisco and most places around the country, you only close if it's actually a real, uh, if there's a real case. I think closing for symptomatic people is going to lead to a lot of chaos and a lot of closure. So that's not something that I think from this study, I actually wouldn't recommend doing that. But I think the symptom screening and keeping kids out is actually important. So in summary, we know more than we did in March. Lots of, la there's layers of how we protect ourselves. Masks, 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 physical distancing, stay home when you're sick and do good screening good ventilation, symptomatic and asymptomatic testing are things we should be considering. I'll talk about that in a minute. Small stable cohorts.
So I'm going to go through a couple of these interventions that I just talked about to give you guys a little bit of more information um, to help clarify some, some things. So this study is a study that came out of Cal, of University of California in Berkeley, and they were looking at masks and stable cohorts and how they relate to testing. So you can see that on this side of the graphic are all the interventions that people that they were looking at. No additional precautions. And then here we have testing, masking, reducing contact, meaning having stable cohorts or combining things. Here you can see the proportion of each group with a symptomatic illness in the fall semester. So they were asking the question, they were sort of modeling, they were using math to try and figure out based on a survey they had done in May, they wanted to figure out how many people, depend, based on how they were behaving, how, are they, how, my, how many people are gonna get COVID depending on what we do here on this side. So you can see teachers, students, household members across the top. And then you have high school, middle school, and elementary school in different colors. You can see no additional precautions. There's gonna be a fair amount of symptomatic infection and that's something that we don't wanna have happen. So then you see teaching, uh, sorry, testing, monthly testing of teachers, weekly testing of teachers, weekly testing of teachers and students. That's good, that actually decreases the number here nicely in all three groups. In comparison, this is actually really important, masks alone, just the mask with no testing at all, does even more than weekly testing of teachers and students. Weekly testing of teachers and students is hard. That's a lot of testing. Uh, it's hard on schools to organize it. It's hard to sort of um, pay for it because it can cost a lot of money. Stable cohorts also very effective at decreasing transmission or decreasing infections. And if you combine them all together, it's looking really good. So that's just helpful to think about where are we gonna put our resources and energy? We should remember how important the masks and stable cohorts can be as we consider decisions about testing. Just briefly, mask types, fabric fine, surgical, surgical fine. Um, gaiters are fine, but double layers probably better than single based on the data that we have. Um, the N95, they're very uncomfortable, so generally, and people don't, would not, like I, I would not recommend wanting to wear that for a long time, so I, reserving it for healthcare settings or um, including people within schools who are doing healthcare, like if they, they're having close contact with a kid, um, or also special ed is, is the other place where, where more intensive um, protective equipment might be needed. Please, please, please do not, do not use valved masks. Do not let your loved ones use valved masks. Um, they are a very good way of spreading infection because that valve actually lets out a stream of infected. If somebody is wearing it and they have COVID-19, they can let out a stream of infected air that's very directed and concentrated. Um, and then one last thing about masks. So it used to be that we said, my mask protects you, your mask protects me. It turns out my mask also protects me, meaning that if you're wearing a mask, you're getting protected because you're just not getting as much virus um, you're not getting exposed to as much virus. So that actually can make it so that you don't, either you don't get the infection or even if you do, you get a less severe infection because it matters how much you, you get exposed to that, um, how severely sick you get. So the implication for that is that that's actionable information for teachers and adult staff who are worried about going back to school that you have control over your own mask. And, um, and you have control over your own mask with the students. And also the really, really important thing we've seen in, in the summer camps and also in the healthcare setting, when you interact with other adults, it's important to remember to not um, take off your mask because you're with adults. We think, oh, I'm not with the patient. I'm not with the student. I'm in with my trusted colleague. I will take off my mask. I will sit down. I might have lunch with that person and I'm gonna hang out. It's actually, that is, where the, the highest risk moments are in school and in healthcare. And so as people are going back, that's helpful for teachers to know, don't eat with other people, don't take off your mask, even though you wanna sort of connect with people, keep your mask on and eat separately with a good six feet of distance between you. Um, and then uh, a couple other things, where are we getting COVID? There's a, there's a nice study that was done. I'm just gonna highlight, um, huh. okay, sorry about that. Um, I'm just gonna highlight the places where People are, uh, this slide is about transportation. Actually, I'm gonna to talk to you guys about transportation because it comes up quite a lot. The study that was done, basically they said, 
how, where are people seeming to get COVID-19 compared to people who don't get COVID-19? Where do, what are the behaviors? It seems to be associated actually with eating indoors in a restaurant, not very surprising, but really important to remember, don't eat indoors in a restaurant, um, particularly nowadays in the high prevalence times. Um, it's why San Francisco is not opening up uh, for the indoor dining and then the bars and coffee shops. Um, interestingly, uh, the place we're not getting it, oops, sorry, um, is the public transportation did not seem to be um, associated, didn't seem to have any increased risk. In fact, there's a slight decrease in risk if you're taking public transportation of getting any of the infection. Um, I will talk briefly about testing, but actually in the interest of time, I think I will not do too much. Um, the basic take home point is that this COVID-19 symptoms look like coughs and colds like that we get all the time. So that means that adults and, and um, uh, students are actually going to get a, a fair amount of testing just because they have a symptom and they've been asked to stay out of school and go get a test. Or if they can't get a test, then they have to stay at home for 10 days. So generally speaking, that's going to lead to a lot of testing as much as we can do for, for people to get back to school. Um, the reason for doing the asymptomatic testing, which means no, you don't have a symptom, but the recommendation from the state is to do asymptomatic testing for teachers. Every, um, every teacher should be tested every two months and it, approximately 25% every two weeks or 50% every month. And the reason for doing that is to help us understand what is going on in the schools as our community rates go up and down in order to help make decisions. Should we maybe change our testing frequency? Should we be closing the schools if it's higher community prevalence, but the schools don't have very much infection in them, maybe it's okay to keep the schools open, which is what other countries have decided to do. Um, and then maybe it would help us change our policies. Maybe it's okay to go to the 20 pod size, or maybe it's not. And this is what's happened in New York City is that they actually were doing, in order to um, help understand for them as their community prevalence went up, they actually were doing some baseline prevalence. They actually did, uh, they did some baseline testing, understanding what's going on in their students and their teachers. They had 16,000 tests, only 28 positives. That was 20 staff and eight students. And that was probably just a school-based case, meaning the person probably had it from outside and then they happened to be in school. That wasn't transmissions that were happening in school. So it was really helpful for people to understand what's happening in the schools as their rates shift in the community. And that was in contrast to Boston that didn't have surveillance and ha shut down much earlier than, um, than New York did because they had hising, high, rising rates and they didn't have test information to tell them what was happening in the schools. So this testing, this asymptomatic testing is really important. So the summary of the testing strategy is just to point out the mitigation strategies are still very effective even without the frequent testing. That's our masking, small stable cohorts, physical distancing, hand hygiene, ventilation, and health screening. It's probably really important as we think about our resources that it's better not to direct money to testing that might be better used elsewhere, like other mitigation, better protective equipment, direct educational support dollars. Um, symptom screenings will lead to testing and potentially catch some cases. And then the asymptomatic testing for school adults for surveillance and decision-making is another piece. Um, there's a couple reflections to say we need our safety layers in place, including ongoing testing to check our assumptions and guide our decision making. I want to acknowledge the emotional roller coaster. One of the hardest times actually might be right before starting. And I think once people get there, like I've seen in schools that are reopening and in healthcare, as you get your routines in place, it gets much easier psychologically, mentally, you just get used to things. We do better with a sense of control. So noting where we have control over, over real safety measures. Um, and as we're going back into this time of rising cases, it's really important for us to continue to prepare for the time when prevalence is, goes down again. So we do think that prevalence probably will go down again. And it will be really helpful if people at least feel like we, we have the option to go back to school in some form when that prevalence goes down and there's less stress there. Um, I'm not gonna go through these slides actually in the, risk, in the interest of time, um, but I'll, I'll just go through this piece, which is that community prevalence will drive the cases in schools. So we really need to be thoughtful as we keep on going through this dance, this up and down, that we have to focus on schools before bars and restaurants in terms of a values decision 
how, how we support our schools to stay open is by not doing high risk activities that affect our inability to, to reopen schools. Um, adult to adult transmission is where we need to focus in the elementary schools. We have more control than we think. Um, opening though cannot be done on the backs of the teachers and staff. And again, what's good for teachers is good for students, is good for families. The system probably needs to allow flexibility for families and teachers. And these are the slides I didn't totally show, but different people have risk tolerance, meaning how risky they feel something is. Different people feel like the benefit might not be as high as the risk. We have to allow families and teachers to, to be able to make their choices and to have some flexibility. And then lastly, school community, really, really, really important. We need to know, particularly as we move forward and there is talk of reopening, um, that there's, there should be a health pledge that's actually written into SFTPH guidance. That health pledge to community safety is not just, oh, check off the box. That is serious. You all got a message to each other that we are pledging as a community. We do positive messaging. We support people. We say, good job, kids, for doing your masking. Don't just say, you have to do this, but you know, really support people in the ways that we know how to do it. Care for each other compassion and not contention, and that there's a commitment to each other to not come back, to not come to school with symptoms. That's a real fear for, for both teachers and, and families that people are just going to show up and they're going to be like, ah, it's just a cough. It's just a little runny nose. Don't come. Go get yourself tested. Um, minimizing high risk behaviors, either traveling or indoor visits, particularly in the holidays. Um, staff support to not transmit by mistake when we're sitting in that break room positive reinforcement I talked about, and then sharing with each other about the stresses and the successes. So that's good stuff too. Um, a helpful quote as we move forward, because this is not an easy road, but if you want to go quickly, you can go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And then that's my summary. Evident, we talked about the evidence on transmission dynamics, best practices for how to reopen safely, and then getting through this together. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Bardock. That was just fantastic. So much information. Thank you so much. Next, I'd like to welcome Dr. Raul Gutierrez. Dr. Gutierrez is a pediatrician at San Francisco General Hospital, and he works with UCSF, Latinx Center of Excellence. He works with a particular focus on immigrant children and families, and we are very grateful that he is here with us tonight. So thank you. Raul, as you know, there has been so much conversation surrounding COVID as it relates to Black and Latino families. As a Black mother and a woman, I know this disease has affected our communities at a larger and more disproportionate rate. I know a lot of my friends and family have been curious about this as well. So if you could speak on what those case numbers mean in San Francisco specifically versus how they trend nationally, that would be deeply personal to me. And if you can tell us about the risks of COVID to best protect our Black and Latino families, students and teachers, and those who may be immunocompromised, essentially those most at risk families in our community, it would be really wonderful. Thank you and welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Yvette. Um, I think you really just asked um, really the question that brings uh, this next presentation together. Um, and, um, in the question that you asked, right, we have to really consider kind of our own personal um, decisions as well as our personal health in terms of our risk, um, for example, being immunocompromised, but also really critically ask the question, why is it that our black and brown and native communities, um, immigrant communities are being affected so disproportionately, even nine months into this pandemic here in the United States? Um, and uh, let's see if we can kind of um, explore and maybe answer some of those questions as we move forward. I'll do my best um, to get uh, through these slides because I really want the community to be able to ask questions and I know there have been a lot. So my disclosure is I am a pediatrician and that is the hat that I mostly wear. Um, I don't have children but I am an uncle. Um, I primarily work with Latinx and immigrant families. I do identify as Latinx and my immediate family has been affected by COVID-19. Um, as well. So I come with that lens. Um, and I want to just point out that COVID-19 does not discriminate. Um, it's our social uh, circumstance and external influences that shape our vulnerability. Um, I also want us to move forward um, with some of these reflections. This is from Trauma Transformed, an organization Trauma Transformed. We acknowledge that we're in the midst of unprecedented times. 
we acknowledge that we are holding a multitude of feelings, responsibilities, fear, and joys at the same time. We acknowledge that, that um, there are many responses to stress and uncertainty, each of them valid. We acknowledge that there is no better opportunity to practice compassion and collective care than right now. This is the work. And we acknowledge the critical need for reflection, inquiry, and prioritization of the most critical needs. So it's no um, secret, um, it's very, very much publicized that the United States has seen extreme disparities in how um, communities are affected by COVID-19. Um, in the United States through November 17th, Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders were most likely to have contracted COVID-19, while Black African American people were most likely um, to have died from COVID-19. And we can see this reflected here in this chart um, and seeing that our Native Hawaiian, American Indian, um, Latinx, and Black African communities um, have much more cases per 100,000 people. And in particular, our Black community is disproportionately affected by death. And in California, through November 17th, um, our Hispanic, uh, excuse me, our Latinx people were most likely to have contracted COVID-19, while our Black African American communities were most likely to have died in the state of California. Um, and then we can see kind of this highlighted here um, in, in California for our Latinx and Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander communities, and then deaths here. Um, uh, with three communities in particularly um, disproportionately affected. And looking at race and ethnicity of children and teens with coronavirus in California in particular, we continue to see the same trend for children. Um, uh, so the same disparities we're seeing in adults we see in children um, as well when we break it down, uh, with 50% of cases um, in California affecting Latinx communities. Um, and if we look at deaths overall um, in uh, the United States, um, we see that our Latinx um, and our Black communities are disproportionately affected um, by death as well. Um, and in particular, our American Indian and Alaska Natives um, are, are, um, are at 3.9 deaths per 1 million. So these are really small numbers just because there haven't been that much death in children overall. Um, and looking here in San Francisco, um, uh, we see that same trend as in California with our Latinx communities having a larger per percentage of uh, COVID cases. Um, and then looking at age, uh, we see that only 11% um, is under the age of 18, um, while our younger adult communities are affected um, um, in higher numbers. Looking at deaths, um, the good news, at least for here in San Francisco, is that we don't have any deaths reported um, for anyone less than 18. So I don't have any data um, to give you in terms of disparities there. Uh, but we have seen in, in, in San Francisco in particular that our Latinx and Asian communities um, have particularly been uh, affected um, by death um, in San Francisco. Again, our death number is quite small um, so, um, um, so these numbers look very dramatic, um, but, but it's still important to note the disparity. Um, and then cases um, in children um, less than 18 from April to July with 674 cases. Again, we see that continuing trend of Latinx children being 64% of those children diagnosed with COVID-19. So why is this happening? Um, so some of the things that um, the San Francisco Department of Public Health points out is maybe this is structural inequity. So structural racism is closely tied to many risk factors as barriers to, for example, home ownership, education, jobs, and healthcare that impact current housing conditions, job opportunities, and many of the social determinants of health. Um, Institutional racism um, is another thing that the San Francisco Department of Public Health points at. And of course, there are other factors. Neighborhood trends may be influenced by other factors like testing availability um, and the density of congregate housing or how many people live in one household. Um, and of course, individual behavior is also something that we need to think about, um, as Dr. Pardark has pointed out. So what is structural racism? So this is the totality of ways in which societies foster discrimination through mutually reinforcing inequitable systems that in turn reinforce discriminatory beliefs, values, and distribution of resources. 
And this has a dramatic impact in the way that people live their lives and are made vulnerable um, to certain disease processes. Looking at this kind of from a more, uh, from a framework, um, we see that the root cause is structural discrimination, whether that be racism, sexism, classism, and so forth, that then informs the tool, so laws, political processes, um, budgetary decisions, regulations, enforcements, um, that then in, impacts systems, our public health system, um, the way our neighborhoods are built, um, the environments that we live in, the education systems that we learn in, that then lead to health and well-being um, outcomes. And uh, several studies have shown um, that this kind of pathway leads um, to health disparities um, through economic injustice, environmental and occupational health inequalities, um, inadequate health care, and so forth. So how does that affect our communities? Um, so this looks really busy, but it's just a map showing um, the new cases um, uh, of COVID-19 in these different, um, um, in uh, the different neighborhoods here in San Francisco. Um, and we can see that new cases at a rate per 10,000 residents um, is highest in the Bayview Hunters Point area, as well as in the Mission. Um, but, um, to really point out some of those um, personal decisions, we see some increase in cases, or new cases, excuse me, um, new cases all over San Francisco, but there are communities that are particularly disproportionately um, affected. Um, and there are several reasons why that might be. Um, and I do want to point out that even in places like the Marina and Presidio Heights, uh, we see some increase in cases, a lot of that attributable to kind of personal decisions in terms of keeping yourself and the people around you safe. Um, and these, and these um, particular disparities exist across different uh, sectors. Um, so here in California, um, in households with children 6 to 18, um, we see that food insecurity um, is, is, um, uh, is more likely reported in Latinx communities as well as Black communities compared to white. And if we look at this even from household um, uh, income, uh, we see that um, um, in particular, um, those earning less than $40,000 a year have very high rates of food insecurity. And this has been demonstrated in San Francisco as well. Um, so the mission, there was a mission census track um, uh, done um, at, uh, towards the beginning of the pandemic earlier this year where they tested almost 4,000 um, people. 40% of those folks were Latinx and 40, about 40% 40 were white. Um, and 83 of those tested positive, so about 2.1% of those, 95% of them were Latinx. And some of the risk factors uh, for recent infections were inability to shelter in place and maintain income, frontline service work, unemployment, and a household income of less than $50,000 a year. A similar study was done at the 16th Mission Transport Hub for BART, um, where they tested 878, of which 69% were Latinx. 3% of those folks tested positive. 81% of those positives were uh, identified as Latinx. Um, the positive rates were 2.8 uh, times higher in food and beverage workers and 8.3 times higher in day laborers. Um, and again, to get to the point of personal decision, um, of all those tested, 82% reported using masks for work and errands, 51% only for social functions, and only 10% at home. This was also done at the 24th Mission Transport Hub, and we found the same kind of, uh, we found the same trends. 9% of those tested positive, um, and of those who tested positive, 93% um, identified as Latinx, 85% were Spanish preferred language, um, really targeting or identifying our immigrant populations, and 87% earned incomes less than 50,000, um, and 79% lived in high density households. So some of the conditions that increase the spread of infection are associated with people living in high density situations, of which those are listed here, or people with high risk economic uh, or work conditions. Um, so essential workers who have extensive contact with the public, people without paid sick leave and or health insurance, or people with low income, uh, excuse me, low income people who must go out into public for resources frequently. Um, we also, um, there's another kind of model looking at the way we move around in our communities. And so this was a computer model looking at mobility um, uh, patterns and virus spread using cell phone data. 
um, and some of the things that they looked at there or saw that there were higher infection rates among disadvantaged racial and socioeconomic groups um, solely from difference in mobility and the way people were moving around. Um, and so um, they really, what they looked at was um, uh, people who live in a particular census or zip code um, and then looked at some uh, locations of interest. Um, and in general, um, and I think the, the really important part here is that um, those people who uh, were of low socioeconomic status, for example, um, had not really reduced their mobility um, compared to other groups. Um, and that some small minority of super spreader locations, so the ones that Dr. Bardak mentioned, restaurants, um, bars, and things like that, may explain a large majority of the infections. Um, and um, this slide is a little busy, I'm not gonna read too much of it, but only to point out that our immigrant communities in particular um, are also at increased risk of acquiring COVID-19 with particularly um, uh, 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 significant socioeconomic outcomes if they do contract the disease, um, including higher morbidity and mortality, um, loss of health insurance, more days off work, um, and so forth. So what does that mean for our schools? Um, and um, this data I, hear, I have here is from the San Francisco Unified School District. Um, and just looking at the data here, um, you know, we already see that um, a quarter of the population identifies as Latinx. And if we put all the subgroups um, who are at high risk, um, that's almost a third of students. Um, and English language learners, again, kind of a proxy for immigrant communities, make up almost 30% of students in the unified school district, with 55% being socioeconomically disadvantaged. I'm going to skip this slide here really quick, but it's only to say that disparities exist in education as well. Um, um, and um, and um, we can also see here that uh, learning technology participation, this was a study um, done in LA, um, we can see that there's disparities even in the amount of activity that students have with, online, uh, with remote um, online learning. Um, again, seeing the disparities with Black and Latinx communities being lowest in terms of engagement. Um, in fact, we asked um, parents um, over at uh, the Children's Health Center at Zuckerberg San Francisco General, are there barriers to your children engaging with school resources like online classroom meetings and assignments? Um, uh, based out of 450 respondents that we looked at, uh, we saw that Latinx patient caregivers were twice as likely to respond yes, and non-English speaking parents, uh, patient caregivers had a 19% increased um, odds of a digital access issue. So um, let me just um, uh, um, finish up here with some key messages. Racial ethnic health inequities are well documented, but there may be um, controversies over explanations of why these inequities persist. So understanding structural racism and bias may help us better address risk factors and disparities. Um, and structural racism involves interconnected institutions, mutually reinforcing inequitable systems that in turn reinforce discriminatory beliefs, values, and distribution of resources, uh, which together affect um, adverse, uh, uh, the risk of adverse health outcomes. Um, the spread of COVID-19 is dependent on many factors, and some key factors contributing to transmission or severity include living in crowded conditions, leaving the house for essential work, unable to limit um, outings, um, having certain pre-existing health conditions, limitations to access and care and other resources. Um, and that structural racism is closely tied with many of these risk factors and data show that communities of, of color bear a disproportionate burden of COVID-19 disease and death. Um, some strategies to think about, um, community-specific, multi-sector, equity-oriented initiatives. We need to work together in different sectors to really address the inequities that we're seeing not only in COVID-19, but in education as well, um, in the midst of this pandemic. Advocating for policy reform, adopting mechanisms that identify structural discrimination, acknowledging it and working to undo it. Um, institute policies to increase economic empowerment um, for those communities impacted. Uh, fund community programs that enhance neighborhood stability. Focus on addressing both social risk factors and unmet social needs. Um, and test and deploy targeted interventions that address social risk factors.
Um, all right, I think that's it. I'm gonna stop there. And I'm gonna stop my share as well. Wonderful, thank you, Raul. That was absolutely fantastic, so much information. Um, if you will all bear with us, we know we're running a little long, but luckily the doctors have agreed to stay on for 10 more minutes after nine. So we're gonna to get to some questions. I know there've been a lot coming in and I'm going to try to get through as many as possible. Um, so first question, a little bit of Q&A from an elementary school teacher. Teaching and learning is a dynamic, silly, loud, song, full, high-filled, fun journey. With COVID limitations within school, certainly learning will be more dynamic than online learning. But will it fit the expectations and needs we are looking for in a school return? Also, what if our students don't follow the rules? Um, as doctors, I know you guys have some suggestions on that. I know that one of the things I learned from the presentation is how well younger children uh, right now are following the rules compared to college students and older students. So if either of you want to elaborate on that, that'd be great. Um, maybe I'll start and Rel also can, can pick up the theme. Um, I saw that question in the chat. I love that image of the boisterous fun, you know, education. I will say that the, the coming back to school psychologically is it's helpful to highlight that it, there is a lot of joy involved with coming back to school for the people I know have come back to school. It's stressful, but there's also just it's helpful to remember that there's joy there. Um, and I think that the, the expectations, I think it's COVID-19 is terrible. It's just, it's limiting our ability to have what we view as the, as normal fulfilling lives. Um, so I think it's within that context. It's not going to be exactly the same as what we're used to. Um, but, uh, but it's, it's, there will be still, I think that there's still that capacity to have some of that joy, joy, joyfulness and boisterousness. Um, maybe do it outside uh, rather than inside is, you know, some of these mitigation strategies are you just have to, we have to begin to rethink creatively. One of the research projects I'm working on is actually trying to gather from the community hubs, what are they doing that's creative and good that actually then other people can learn from. Uh, and we'll be passing that on to SFUSD and any of the other schools. Uh, and then um, what if the kids don't follow the rules? I think you, I think we just have to use like, and the educators will use their, what I've been calling their mad teacher skills with a Z, which is like, they're good at knowing how to get kids to do things. That's a lot about setting up routines, setting up expectations, setting up peer expectations and support for everybody. And then um, thinking about positive reinforcement. And then at the very last phase, it's the negative reinforcement. But I think that we're, we should remember that we're good at, at helping kids do the right thing. And that, it, it, that because we're stressed, people sort of wanna reach to like, okay, send the kid home if they're not complaining their mask. But I think we have to go back to like, no, nope, we know how to do it right with the kids and support them. So um, that would be where I would go. Roll anything else you wanna? No, I, I just wanna echo everything that um, Dr. Bradak said. And um, you know, sometimes, sometimes the, 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 the disappointment that we experience is our own disappointment. Um, you know, some of these kids just, you know, it's going to be a new experience for them and they're going to be excited um, and they're going to want to engage um, because that's what children want to do. Um, and so we, I think, as adults um, need to be really mindful of what we're doing and how we're modeling the way um, and able to create these kind of special moments for kids and to really foster their development as much as possible. It's not going to look the same as the way we did it. Um, and that's okay. Um, these are these are experiences that we're creating for our youth um, and to be able to, uh, to have them embrace that um, and kind of move forward. Thank you. Raul, some of our Decreasing the Distance Mission Latina moms asked, we're wondering if we have herd immunity as a community because many of us have already gotten sick. How does that impact things? Um, I think that's a really important question. I know there's been a lot of talk about um, herd immunity um, and kind of what that means. Um, and the, the key thing here is that when we're talking about herd immunity, we're talking about everybody in the community, um, everyone that's around us, um, regardless of um, our, our racial or ethnic back, uh, background. Um, and so we really have to think about the, whole, the community as a whole, the city as a whole, um, whatever that group is that you identify. Um, in terms of um, thinking about herd immunity. And we're just not at the numbers um, at this point to really even think about herd immunity or, or um, how that's gonna work. Um, now, if we're talking about risk reduction um, and thinking about um, uh, uh, risk reduction for the people that are, are in our immediate families, 
um, or houses that we're going to with extended family and things like that. These would be great questions to ask um, um, your doctor and kind of thinking about how can I reduce my risk if I've already been sick? Um, you know, what is the risk of getting someone else uh, or if someone else getting sick? Um, how can I think about mitigation of transmission in my family if somebody else doesn't have it that I did? Um, and they're kind of complex questions. We kind of have to think about all those um, different aspects. Uh, but in terms of herd immunity, I just don't think we have the numbers at all um, to really think about that at this point. Thank you. Last night on the Board of Education call, we heard from many um, immunocompromised staff, um, a lot of our Black, Indigenous, people of color teachers, and a lot of family members and supports for CAC sharing their fears and concerns about returning to school for them and their families and their students, obviously. Given the outsized impact on people of color, how do you as physicians address those concerns? Um, I'll start off um, with that one. Um, and I think, um, I think, again, what we have to kind of identify is that understanding that there are particular communities that have been disproportionately impacted but we really need to hone in on why that is, right? What are the systems in place that place, um, that place us and, and, and communities of color in vulnerable situations? Um, and where can we redirect the resources um, to be able to mitigate those harms and or get rid of those harms completely um, with policy change? Um, it's not easy, um, for sure. Um, this is an ongoing um, uh, a struggle in the, um, in the bigger fight um, for equity um, and, and, and justice. Um, but um, I, I think we really have to think about what is it about upstream? What is it the conditions um, that are placing us, uh, 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 communities of color, in vulnerable situations that, um, that drive um, transmission within those communities and illness? Naomi? Maybe that. No, I think that's. I think that's. That's right. It's really important to um, to help people think. It, it's. It's sometimes easy to think if you're um, in a in a population that's getting more affected. So the Latinx population that like maybe it's my body or my kid's body that's more at risk. And it's really important what what Dr. Gutierrez was just saying is that it's it's about the 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 um, sort of structural. Things that are happening, it's high risk um, occupations and living situations. And so your child walking through the door at school doesn't have any different risk of getting COVID-19 than any other child of any other racial, racial or ethnic group. Um, so uh, it, it, everybody needs to stay safe, and it, but it doesn't mean that you're physically more at risk. And that's just really important to remember. Um, uh, yeah. And I think knowing some of this information has informed, you know, where it is that we have testing sites. Um, it could also inform things like what kind of resources do we provide a family that we know has particular risk factors in place? Um, and how is it that we can get um, a child who has to quarantine or isolate um, back to school as quickly as possible in a safe way? Um, and really understanding um, uh, the, the components that go into making sure that that happens quickly. Thank you. Okay, so I want to talk about ventilation. <laughs> it seems like that's been on everybody's mind. I was hoping that you could help break down ventilation for me a little bit. Um, I know for teachers, there's a lot of questions about are windows enough? Is an open window enough? Is a fan enough? Um, we've heard airflow is important, even in our own homes, right? So I, apparently the World Health Organization has some guidelines um, about how much air needs to be freshed and how often. So a lot of uh, teachers, I'm thinking educators, are interested in knowing, is there a way to measure the airflow in real time to make conditions safer in classrooms at all? Mm -hmm. uh, so I'll d I'm not a ventilation expert, um, but I will say what I have learned because I'm like, I gotta, I gotta know something about ventilation. Um, there are something called uh, CO2 monitors, um, which basically, because when we breathe out, human beings breathe out, we breathe out CO2. So you can measure like a little, you know, it's a little clicky thing in the air. It captures a, a reading of how much CO2 is in the air. That is one way of assessing whether or not you actually are well ventilated or not. Um, the only 
trick to that is that it will tell you if you have your window open and your door open, are you getting enough fresh air moving through because that will get rid of the CO2 and take it out of the room. The CO2 measurement device, if you have an air purifier that's just cleaning the air to get the virus out of the air, the CO2 measurement won't tell you anything because the air purifier is not taking the CO2 out. So if you're talking just about measuring, that's one thing. Most people are not really using CO2 measures, but I will say the other thing about ventilation, two points of ventilation, much better than one. And fans should be pulling air out of a space rather than directing it across a space. So we know that if, you if you're in a closed restaurant, they had a nice study in China, and you have, everything's closed, and you have air blowing in one direction, and here's the infected person, then that actually is a good way to pass the virus to other people. So you don't want the air to be directing through the classroom, you want it to be pulling air out of the classroom rather than pushing air into the classroom. That ventilation is fun. <laughs> All of a sudden. Thank you. So I know we are getting pretty close here on timing. Um, Naomi, you mentioned earlier, I know a lot of teachers have written in to talk about their fears as well as us as parents writing in as well. Flu season's coming up. And I know that you mentioned earlier that it doesn't really react to the same way as COVID-19. Can you explain that as a parent for me as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, each infectious disease we have actually has a different, um, what they call sort of inf infectivity or, or how infectious it is. And so like, for instance, measles, very, very, very infectious. If you're in the same space as somebody else with measles, it's very easy for it to pass from one person to the other. Compared to measles, influenza is less infectious. And then in kids in particular, influenza tends to pass between kids COVID-19 for some reason in kids, and it's all those things that I sort of talked about in the talk, it just doesn't pass the way flu influenza passes. So it's just it, that kids don't seem to pass around COVID-19 the same way they pass around influenza. So that's one piece. The other piece that sometimes comes up for people is, um, how do I know the difference between COVID-19 and influenza? You know, fever, cough, that seems to be kind of the same. They, they're very hard to tell the difference. Doctors can't tell the difference without a test. Parents can't tell the difference without a test. And that's why that symptom screening is so very important in order to help make sure you go get tested. And the last really helpful thing to think about is getting a flu vaccine can help prevent anybody getting flu and therefore you won't get symptoms that look like COVID which can be really stressful to get symptoms that look like COVID. And so that's another reason to get the flu vaccine is not only because it'll protect you against flu and it won't be as much of a burden on the healthcare system, you know, then people won't be getting sick with the flu. Also because it will mean that you will not look like you are getting COVID and that will be, help you as well. All right, we're gonna get down to our last two questions here so that we can let everyone go. We thank you all so much for staying a little bit late here. Um, one parent asked, I have heard this so much myself, what can any of you tell us about vaccines being viable in the near future or the likelihood of COVID cases being gone before the end of this school year in case they're thinking about returning? Mm -hmm. um, maybe I'll take this one, Dr. Gutierrez. Yeah, I can add a little after you. Okay, perfect. Um, so vaccines, uh, the good news, they're looking much more promising than they were even two weeks ago. Um, that, but it's going to take a very long time for us to be able to make enough, and just not us, but like the system, to make enough doses and then to get all those doses pushed out to people. They have a phased approach and you can look up online. There's actually like a very clear um, framework for who's going to get them first. Healthcare workers, very high risk adults will get them first. Schools are actually close. They're in phase two, so that's good. But the idea that we're going to be able to use a vaccine and be able to reopen schools before the end of the year is actually, it's almost every expert is, is thinking that that's not going to it's not gonna, it's not gonna happen like this. So I think we're looking, the vaccine will not solve it before June. Yeah, the only thing that I would add is, um, you know, I, I'm hoping that um, our municipalities and government agencies have kind of learned lessons about equity and who gets, you know, we learned a lot about who's getting tested, who's, what's available, 
um, and how quickly can some communities versus other communities get their testing and the results. And I'm hoping that we've learned quite a bit from that um, to be able to apply our lessons learned to vaccines in terms of who's getting the vaccines, how quickly, um, and who gets to kind of go back to um, some semblance of, of, of life the way we used to before. So it's going to take some time um, to get that all right. And I'll, I think we should give California State a shout out. They have an equity metric that they're tracking at all the counties. So I'm hoping that they have this on their radar that like part of the equity metric is how well are we distributing vaccines to the um, higher risk communities. Great. All right, last question. We made it. Um, Naomi, I promised my children I would ask a question for them and their friends and other students. Semi quote, what is up with sports? When can we actually play basketball and soccer or football again? What are your thoughts on this very important issue regarding when children will be able to interact together in an actual sporting atmosphere? This is a hard one. I was sort of hoping you wouldn't ask me this question. <laughs> um, I, I will say very, with great empathy, it is really, really, really hard to not be able to play the sports the way we, we need to and our bodies need to. Um, you know, the recommendation is get as much exercise as you can, continue to do conditioning for the sport, you know, your favorite sport. Um, and just to explain a little bit, because I know it's, 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 it's just hard, but the, um, uh, you know, indoor is worse than outdoor. So the indoor sports are really going to be limited, indoor basketball, et cetera, because that's, it's much easier. The virus doesn't go away in the indoor space. And then the problem with the sports is that the more heavy breathing, like you, you, you work hard and then you breathe heavy and that's how you pass it along to each other. And if you're doing close contact with your sports, that's, that's where it happens. So, um, that's kind of the rationale behind it. When is it going to happen? It's going to be, it's, we have to get to be a lower, a much lower prevalence. So how does that uh, contrast then with, I mean, obviously the playgrounds are open. Is it just the exertion of sports that's different than allowing them to like recess if they were at recess and they're on the playgrounds and the playgrounds uh, versus I, I assume have actually having interaction with each other in a different way because children are on playgrounds now. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, you know, at the hubs and everywhere else that they're wearing masks and it seems fine. So is it really more just about the exertion of playing an actual physical sport in close contact. Yeah, it's the close contact and it's the super heavy breathing. The kids in playgrounds can sometimes breathe that heavy, but it's just, it's, it's like a known thing when you're running around, you're playing soccer hard, you're playing football hard. Yeah. Hey, well, I know now we've even gone over our extra two minutes over the 910, so I'm going to start wrapping this up. On behalf of decreasing the distance, uh, we hope many of you found some of this presentation to be helpful and useful. I learn something every time. I am still absolutely like, wow. Um, we would like to extend a huge thank you to Dr. Bardock and Dr. Gutierrez for providing such important information. We'd also like to thank UCSF for hosting this town hall, our interpreters tonight, Raquel and Glenn, and all of you for joining us. If you have any questions about what you heard tonight or our efforts at decreasing the distance, please reach out. We'll put our contact information in the chat We'll also be sending out a very short survey, very, that will help us consider meaningful topics for future events. So be on the lookout for that as well. Thank you all so much for attending. Have a good evening and be well. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Good night. Thank you for the invitation. Take care, everyone.